Good morning. Welcome to Executive Insights by MediaCorp. I'm Cheng Han, your facilitator and moderator for this webinar where we will talk about the effectiveness of media channels in driving consumer purchase decisions. We are joined today by two guest speakers. The first, Julius, General Manager of Media Research Consultants with over 12 years of experience in the consumer research industry and public service sector. Julius, would you like to say hello to the audience? Hi, very good morning to everyone. It's a privilege to be here with everyone this morning. Thanks, Julius. Our second speaker is Raj, who leads the digital sales team at MediaCorp, working with over 700 clients annually for their digital solutioning needs. He describes himself as a passionate storyteller. So Raj, will we hear some stories today? Absolutely, you will, Jinan. Thanks for the warm intro and good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. As for myself, as my designation suggests, I work on commercial planning and strategic solutions with a special focus on developing performance solutions for strategic clients such as Lazada, KFC, and Giant. So what can we expect today out of this session? Now, if you are here for data-backed understanding of your customer shopping journey and motivations, undeniable proof of the impact of omni-channel marketing to the consumer and guidance for your creative development process, then you are definitely at the right place. But before we share with you our findings, let us remind ourselves of the business environment that we are currently operating in. Firstly, we are currently seeing the return of an extremely competitive environment. From left to right, not only is retail growing year on year, it is also being driven by physical shopping. Another evidence of Singaporeans going out more is how the F&B index has grown by 15%, which includes consumption in restaurants, fast food outlets, and cafes. Now, most significantly, Singaporeans are traveling more, where air passenger departures have more than doubled since last year. Now, what this means is that media campaigns need to be sharper and the messaging even clearer to fight for a shrunken pool of addressable audience that now have so many more options to spend their time and money. Secondly, the surge in growth for e-commerce during the, pand the pandemic that we thought may never end seems to have stabilized. In fact, in the latest data point all the way to the right, we can actually see a 2% decline in contribution by e-commerce to retail sales in Singapore. Now, what this means is that the large majority of the retail economy is still driven by physical stores. So while you continue to build your e-commerce channels, it is still important to make sure your customer enjoys a great retail experience in your store. I know this unpredictability must also be at the top of your mind because from client conversations, everyone is consistently wondering how consumers may have shifted as we come out of the pandemic, which prompted us to commission this three-month research study with media research consultants to find out more. Julius, you worked on this study. Can you please tell us more about it? Yes, certainly. Right. So this study to understand the impact of media channels and driving consumer purchase decision was many, many months in the making, right? So Cheng Han and I had started conceptualizing study in mid-2022, around a time when most COVID, uh, most major COVID measures were eased in Singapore. This online survey was conducted from November to December 2022, and uh, we spoke to Singaporeans and PR age 18 to 65 years old. We ensured that age, gender, and race are proportionally aligned to the national population within the same age range. And the respondents must consume any type of media at least once a month. And they are also shoppers who have purchased products online frequently, at least once a week, that is. And also browse and purchase products via offline channels in the past month. And we uh, poll about a thousand respondents. Uh, and, they have, uh, and, and, and this is uh, a very insightful study, which I'm very eager to share. So what I will do is that I will kick off the sharing of these findings and get around warmed up in the room and engage. Here is a little exercise for you, and we would love to get maximum participation in this poll, right? So what you see right now is a pop-up, it's a poll. So uh, true or false, right? Groceries, food, household items, children, toys are the top three product categories purchased online, right? So you see the poll down there, please actively participate. 
right? So I repeat the question again. Groceries, household items, and children toys are the top three product categories purchased online. True or false? Yeah, maybe we think about how your friends buy and how you buy. You know, what do you talk about your, to your friends about when you do your purchase decisions online? And maybe we will see whether you are correct. Uh, so majority has selected true, right? However, yeah. So myth busted, the answer to what are the top product categories purchased online is a little more nuanced, right? We wanted to understand more about Singaporeans browsing and purchasing behavior online and offline for various product category. And this is what we found, right? What you see on the chart right now, okay? These are the top product categories browsed and purchased online. And the top three are Baby supplies, entertainment tickets, and books. The top three product categories browse offline and purchase online are home appliances, books, and children toys. And the top three product categories browse online and purchase offline are furniture, consumer electronics, and home appliances. Lastly, the top three product categories browse and purchase offline, right? are groceries, toiletries, and household items. This may seem a little surprising, but I'll elaborate why it is not, right? For example, baby supplies, entertainment, tickets, books. These are what we call low involvement purchases, right? These are items that may be relatively inexpensive, pose low risk, meaning that you can exchange it, return it, or easily replace it, right? And it doesn't require significant research or comparison um, online, right? Or when you shop it. So hence, shopper will just browse and purchase such products online. And by contrast, right, high involvement purchases such as furniture, consumer electronics, and home appliances, these carry a higher risk to buyers if they fail, right? And they have higher price tags. Therefore, consumers want to do more research, be able to touch and feel and experience the product before making a purchase. You know, Julius, this reminds me of a conversation that I had recently with a consumer electronics retailer client. He continues to believe in the offline retail experience and his sales is still obviously significantly contributed by his offline stores. For a client like him, it may be very easy to decide to de-emphasize the online experience, but looking at these results, it really provides guidance and a clue on how consumers may be using your e-commerce channel or your website. Yeah, As some consumer electronics can be quite expensive, they will definitely use the website to do their own research. So I guess it's important to win this space, even if it's just to win this step in the purchase decision process. Now that we have looked at online buyers, um, let us find out what are they looking for? Does everyone think that they are mainly looking for vouchers and discounts? Who thinks so? We are gonna launch the poll right now. Let us know where you stand. Singaporeans shop online mainly because of the vouchers and discounts available on e-commerce platforms. True or false? I think some of you uh, on the marketing side will have your own experiences, but we are also looking forward to sharing with you our insights. Yeah, yeah. this sounds a lot like my wife, right? We can shop and there's vouchers and discounts. Not just your wife. I do so as well. Oh, yes. So I guess the, the poll says that a majority thinks that is true. Uh, Julius, what is it then? Uh, so myth busted, right? The top reasons why Singaporeans online shoppers purchase products online are 24-7 access, convenience, and cheaper pricing. Vouchers and discounts and online executive, uh, ex exclusive sale campaign are also reasons, but they're not the top reasons. So the key takeaway, right? is that accessibility, you know, buying whenever I need or I want the product and convenience are the top reasons why shoppers purchase products online. And what, what, what does this mean then, right? What's the implication? For online e-commerce platform players or any brands who have an online shop, right? You should shout out these key benefits of shopping online in your comms and your campaigns on top of your usual monthly sale discount campaigns, right? Because this is why shoppers shop online. It is, again, 24-7 access and convenience. It's interesting you say that, Julius. 
because when we run digital campaigns for our e-commerce advertisers, they are laser focused on deals. Uh, this they talk a lot about deals. They creative talk about their monthly sales. They do product level targeting as well as retargeting. Perhaps something like this uh, gives them some food for thought to think about having a different creative focused on the convenience benefits and how it really makes a big difference in their purchase decisions. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Raj, you made a very good point. It is something for brands and advertisers to really ponder and reconsider how you want to stand in front of competition with your ads, right? So, you know, what you see right now on the slide is that, you know, some, some e-commerce players seem to get it and it's reflected their more recent campaigns, but there are some e-commerce players, I'm not going to mention any names, right? Who will try to outdo one another by running monthly campaign sale, right? As far as growing mid-month sale. And more recently, I've been seeing payday sale and month sale. Yeah, trust me, it's not more recently. We've been seeing it for the last three years now. <laughs> a lot of us are guilty making those impulse purchases. Um, but I think this is a good example, uh, Julius, that you share between both of the different kind of creators. And, you know, we can look at the numbers in terms of the video views that they've achieved. And it paints a great picture. Um, I think this tells us just as a great example on why maybe something like a festive focused creative or even a brand focused creative builds more brand love and then obviously transforms into higher sales for the e-commerce platform versus purely just focusing on sale days price and those kind of bottom line yes yes there's no nice way to put it right discounting sales is a race to the bottom yes on online you can you can get put good deals right but um, you you if you if players are just you know trying to put out sale after sale, you it's a race to the bottom. And you know when it comes to the choice of online retailer, right? Uh, what we noticed from our study is that online marketplace platforms such as Lazada, Shopee, Carousel, Amazon, remains the most popular online platform, followed by online retailers such as FairPrice, Decathlon, and Courts, and single brand websites. And interestingly, we noticed that online retailers, single brand websites, tend to be more popular among younger shoppers and shoppers with a higher money household income, right? 15,000 and above. Well, it, it sounds like the majority of our purchases can be done online with all these retailers, right? So what then does the offline shopping look like? Now, this is not a poll, but do you identify with this statement? I rarely shop offline. I buy everything I need from Lazada, Shopee, Amazon, FairPrice, and many, many more places. Do you identify with this statement? I think I do. <laughs> so, Julius, what's yeah. our insight over here? Yeah. So, so, surprise, surprise, right? For those of you who identify with this statement, you belong to the minority because what our study found is that more than 75% or three in four frequent online shoppers also shop and purchase offline, right? So markets, hypermarkets are the most popular offline platforms to shop, followed by the popular stores such as Tangs, Daka, Don Donkey, right? And of course, large retailers like Decathlon and Courts. Um, these department stores and large retailers tend to be more popular among, right, those who have a higher monthly household income. So, so you know, what does this mean, right? I mean, the, 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 the implication here is that, you know, offline channels still have a place in the sun, especially for those higher household incomes. And we probe further, right? So we probe further to try to understand, you know, hmm, what are the reasons, right? Online shoppers still purchase online, offline, right? And the top three reasons are the ability to try out products. They can also be able to receive the products and items on the same day of purchase. And of course, the support that they get, they get right, from the in-store salesperson on the spot. Um, again, what, what does this mean? What's the implication, right? It's, I think the key point here is that physical retail presence is still important. I, uh, whether is it you know permanent or pop-up stores, these offline spaces are touch points to allow your consumers, your customers, to experience and learn more about your products. They also serve as great out-of-home marketing for your brand. And you know, one classic example that I think we can all relate to, right, is Apple Store, right? Apple Store, they have lots of traffic, right, in store. And actually, a lot of the traffic in store is really good into the, into the store to experience and learn more about Apple products and services. Not so much sale, right? And, you know, bringing it back to, you know, uh, FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods uh, brands, owners in this room, 
think about supermarkets. Supermarkets is a great offline space, right? And it's a great offline space for trade marketing activities, such as doing in-store food sampling when you are launching new flavors, new product flavors, right? So what does this mean, right? So if you're going to run a campaign, right? Uh, so let's say it's a launch of a new product, a new flavor. The marketing teams, right? And the trade marketing teams in, the, in your company, right? Really need to work closer to be more coordinated in your above the line and below the line marketing activities. Right. So moving on, to, moving on right? In, in, in our study, we also showed shoppers a series of statements. We asked them to what extent do they agree or disagree with the statements based on their online shopping behavior in the past month? So 73% of them agreed that they look forward to annual shopping events and 64% of them will wait for monthly double-digit campaigns. So the key takeaway here is that Singaporean shoppers are still bargain and deal hunters, significantly so for the younger, 18 to 34 years old, and also shoppers from higher income households. You know, Julius, this reminds me of a travel client that I worked with recently. During campaign planning, right, there were deep considerations on whether it will be possible to try and intercept the annual event to lock the consumer's budgets ahead of time with a super sweet deal. We decided to proceed as an experiment together with them, but this insight is indeed proven right because one week before the annual event, we witnessed a 60% decline in sales. So for all of you out there, this really means that it's important to be part of the annual events and to plan your calendar around it. Hmm. Indeed, yeah. But here's another insight to chew on, right? Uh, we found that 79% are likely to purchase a product when they're seeing something of their interest. So the key takeaway for me when I saw this, right, was that impulse buying is still a thing, right? Uh, especially for individuals with higher household income. We are, after all, you know, creatures of emotions and we are wired to want things and desire things. So this impulse buying, right, is still a thing for Singaporeans. And here's an opportunity for, you know, brands and advertisers to grow your sales, right, by creating the occasion to drive impulse buying. And the question I would like everyone to, you know, maybe ponder a bit is that how can brands and advertisers create that occasion and opportunities to drive that shopper impulse, both in the online and offline space? You know, can the use of different marketing channels help to create such desires, right, to drive impulse buying? All right, there's something for you to think about and ponder. I think, Julius, this is, a, <clears throat> this is definitely an important data point to consider for e-commerce advertisers. So outside of, you know, we see a lot of uh, e-commerce advertisers do a lot of retargeting to their consumers. But this data shows us that they could also target very specific audiences. So in your previous slide, you showed us um, a little bit about a demographic standpoint, how 18 to 34-year-olds uh, are clear winners right, in terms of making those purchases. Yep. And another stat that is really staring me in the face is 80% have a monthly household income of about $20,000. Again, this isn't something I've seen advertisers use in their digital ads or even in their digital campaigns. So it definitely helps with conversions because the higher income groups are more open to impulse purchases and they make those big ticket purchases. They will spend more on much, much more expensive goods. Yeah. Thanks, Raj. Um, we have actually come to the end of the first section. So maybe we can take in some questions. Okay, I think the first questions actually come, uh, okay, I, am I supposed to mention a name? I don't think so. But the question is, don't, let, and let me bring, go back to the side. Don't discounts and vouchers lead to cheaper pricing and hence those two factors are not unrelated. I believe we're talking about the reasons why shoppers pick certain uh, online, uh, the main reasons for online purchases. And I'm wondering, um, maybe Julius, you can help us understand the difference between that and vouchers and discounts? Yeah, so, okay. Uh... So I give an example, right? I, I, I'm a collector of uh, some specific toy brand. And uh, what happens is that, right, the, this particular toy brand, even without the vouchers and discounts, it is still somehow cheaper online compared to offline space. Because of course, when you, when you look at online space, right, why they can charge cheaper items? Because there is the, they don't layer on the additional uh, 
costs, right, that would come in from an offline context. That's why when we talk about, you know, cheaper compared offline, I think we're not talking about vouchers and discounts later on. In itself, the product itself is cheaper because they don't add those offline costs onto the product. That's why you are able to find pro same products offline, online, but it's cheaper online. So not necessarily discounts and vouchers making it cheaper. Yeah, I, I guess I guess what we, we are trying to say is that, yes, they may eventually lead to cheaper pricing, but asking them in such a fine manner can help us dive much deeper into the consumer's motivations for choosing a online purchase, Yeah, right? And and that to remind everyone again, the online, the top reasons, right, top two at least, right, it's really the accessibility, right? Be able to buy whatever they want and convenience. So you will want to spend time to shout out those, those right, and to just talk about discounts and vouchers because, again, that, that's really a race to the bottom. Cool. Uh, maybe we can just take two very quick questions. Uh, the first question is, how about things related to hobbies like painting? Uh, I think this goes back to the 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 slide where we talk about online offline uh browsing and online offline purchasing they were we able to ask some questions there that were related to hobbies oh okay um so i will not be able to answer that directly but i think if we look at uh the closest to it right probably is sports and lifestyle right so i mean what we see that the incidence of purchasing uh and browsing online is still Quite high, about fifty three percent of them do purchase sports and lifestyle, and again, it's not a direct link to hobbies. But I would say that this is probably the closest. Yeah. So the incidence of purchasing online for sport lifestyle, which is a link to hobbies, is still about you know, uh, one in two, right? Yeah, and this seems to be related to another question by anonymous attendee that does this survey uh cover purchasing services online? Uh, so, so, okay, so we, we focus mainly on uh, products, yeah, no, less so on purchase, uh, services. So what you see, that's why you see on the slide, right, mainly are all product categories and less so services. Yeah, so if uh, there's any guidance, maybe it's the entertainment, ticketing services, as well as the sports and lifestyle that uh, may have covered some of it. Yep. Yeah. All right, Um. there are a few more questions. Um we would take them along the way. Uh, so stay tuned. Now let's get back to the presentation. And let me find the slides. Now, actually, after we find out all this, um, all these preferences by consumers and, and their reasons for buying online and offline, actually the question you must be having in your heads is, then what can I do for advertising? How should it look like now? So a question for you to ponder. Since the media landscape is fragmented and saturated, is my target audience still able to recall my ads? Julius, can you help us out? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be a little tongue-in-cheek here, right? And say this, right? So marketing hits in the audience. If you are telling your boss this statement, right? That, oh, the media landscape is very fragmented and saturated. It's very hard for, you know, uh, our target audience to recall our ads. Mm, I will say this, uh, uh, please stop lying to your boss. Just tell them that yeah, you need more money, right? And likewise, if your teams right, are telling you this, uh, you can probably start opening your LinkedIn app right now and start your hiring process. And if this was a physical seminar, I'll tell you to start exchanging name cards with your neighbors front and back, right? And left and right. Okay, but why, why am I saying this? Why, why am I saying this, right? Because our study found that, right, 68% of shoppers are able to recall from at least three media platforms, right? They're able to record ads from at least three media platforms. And media platforms here we refer to, you know, either TV, radio, out of home, digital, and social media, right? So this is quite significant, 68% are able to record ads from at least three media platforms. And we also look at the average number of platforms. And we found that um, shoppers, they recall seeing ads across 2.8 platforms. Yeah, if we were to, if I were just to help everyone dive in deeper to two and three platforms, you can actually see that there's a 38% jump in ad recallability when you use three platforms versus two platforms. Yeah, so what, what does this mean, right? You know, this means that, you know, if brands, advertisers wants to improve your brand recall, your brand ad recall among shoppers, you will need to run your marketing campaign across at least three media platforms to really boost that recallability. 
Now, so all of you, yeah, go Julius on. and Renan, do you all know which these two or three platforms are? <laughs> um, but before that, maybe we can have another quick poll. Okay, we promise you this is going to be the last one, and we will. I and we think that you'll be definitely interested to hear what are some of the most popular omni-channel media mix that we are seeing uh, in the market. So what do you think is the most popular omni-channel media mix now that we have established that you know, there's a need for three or more media platforms? So we have uh, digital outdoor TV, number two, outdoor radio and TV, number three, digital outdoor radio and TV, sounds like everything, uh, and number four, digital radio and TV. Which of these do you use? Which of these are you considering using? I think by now our audience may be thinking, are these all quick trick questions? Yeah, for the first two, it seems like you have successfully tricked them, but I promise you this one is not supposed to be a trick question. I think most of them are waiting for you to spill the beans. <laughs> All right, what do the results say? Oh, it's, it seems uh, quite mixed actually, where the most is digital, outdoor and TV. Yeah, is this you trying to justify your buy? Yep. Let us take a look at uh, what we actually have seen after we studied over a few thousand campaigns in, uh, in MediaCorp. Well, indeed, uh, clients and agencies alike have all cracked the code that the three Platform mix is something that works. And the most popular omnichannel combination we can see over here is digital, radio, and TV, where you can see an overwhelming lead over the next favorite com combination. But we do know that not all platforms are made equal. Right, Julius? Yeah, yeah. So I think enough of teasing. Which media platform is most effective in terms of reliability? I think that's what's in everyone's mind right now. And what you see on the slide right now is social media, right? Social media has the highest ad recall rates with 68% of shoppers recalling seeing the ads on social media platforms, followed by digital at 63 and TV at 59. So the key takeaway is that nearly two thirds, right? Or 65% of shoppers on average took follow-up actions, right? After seeing the ads on various platforms. So in terms of, you know, recallability, yes, there's slight difference. But what we see is that the actions taken they're, they are all quite equally effective, right? So what do they do, right? What kind of actions they search for more information about a brand and product online? They share information about the ad with their friends or maybe to a screenshot. So again, this means that in terms of effectiveness, and here I define as driving follow-up actions, social media, digital, TV are equally effective. And what, what does this mean then for brands, right? For brands and advertisers, you need to be searchable online. I think this one we all know, but I think what's key here is, the key word here is updated, right? Online presence. You need to have a pre online presence either on the form of face, a website, a, a social media page like Facebook or Instagram. I mean, we all have that, but I think the key word here is that you need to make sure it's updated, right? And of course, lastly, brands with a presence across all these platforms, right? Do stand, stand out a lot more. Now, now that we see so many different, uh, I mean, the great recall and actions taken, um, could there be some examples of good, successful ads that uh, we may consider? Absolutely. I think that's, that's a good segue into what we'll be talking about next. So let's give a flavor to our audiences today on what ads actually do well, right? So talking about digital and social, there are a lot of good ads there that brands have served across digital and social platforms. Uh, I'll be sharing some real case studies, some real examples in the next few slides about how some brands have really pushed the creative boundaries to serve more impactful ads on digital. <clears throat> but before I show uh, these examples and these formats, it's important to look at ads from a slightly different perspective. What I mean by different perspective is ads have now taken a very different form 
So back in the day, or even till the recent past, most of the brands were after their 30 seconders, their 15 seconders videos, and they were looking at more video content and more short form video content. While that still has a place in the mainstream, um, there are certain cases where even a 40 minute content piece actually works extremely well. So let's look at uh, a case study from a local social IP called Bloomer Pulse, right? Bloomer Pulse has done fabulous work with their recent uh, round table around the subject of let's get healthy. Now, Bloomer Pulse is a 40 minute social video that sits on YouTube as well as other social channels. It's a round table discussion format with KOLs as well as certain subject matter experts that really drive meaningful social dialogues uh, on issues that resonate with local Singaporeans. The format is 40 minutes, so it's, it's not exactly short, but it's not exactly extremely long as well. Um, and this is a great way to engage in dialogue about your brand, as well as thought leadership about the industry your brand sits in. Uh, what this does is it invokes a sense of conversation. It invokes a sense of actually chatting with another person or hearing a bunch of people chatting about a subject and, and about how a brand fits into that subject or into that industry. So I think the key message here is ads really need to drive more impactful conversations to your target audiences, and it needs to feel less like an ad and more like a conversation. So as promised, let's take a look at some popular digital formats. Now, there are a few ways where brands have really pushed the boundaries. So if you take a look at Suntory as an example, on one side, you will see that they are focusing on one single product, which is their Sundari Whiskey. But on the other side, they are show showcasing uh, an array of multiple products that they are into. Now, the cool part about both the ads is it transforms and it uses a multiple of um, multiple creative avenues, everything from videos to carousels, and it serves them to the user in style. The user doesn't actually need to go out of the page all of the actions taken are within the ad, as well as it gives a user a choice and uh, an option to engage with the ad in their own style, in the way they want. The next one is a, a recent example. So a, a lot of you Transformers fans out there may have probably seen the new trailer of the new film. They've introduced multiple new characters in the film, right? Now, everyone knows Bumblebee, everyone knows Optimus Prime, but what about the other, other characters? They are equally important in the, new, uh, in the new franchise. Now, this is a great ad format, which actually looks at um, more than just one character. In fact, a bunch of different characters gives a short introduction to each. And again, the power of choosing which character you want to learn more about is really in the hands of the consumer. They can click on any of the individual verticals, learn more, go back, watch the trailer, learn more about a new character. It all happens within the same space of the ad itself. Next up, we have a very interesting one that a lot of clients are buying more and more of, which is transforming your social posts into digital premium environments. Now, a lot of good work has been done by brands as well as agencies and advertisers in creating really outstanding work on their social posts, whether it's a social video, whether it's an Instagram story, it's a carousel post, regular photo post, you name it. Now, what happens is that post will then just sit within the social platform. So how do you really bring it alive? How do you reach a fresh set of eyes, a fresh set of audiences, and show them what that post is all about? You can do this by moving into a premium digital environment. And why that's important is because you also, you also end up having increasing uh, your viewability as well as reach. So there is a, a three times higher um, viewability on um, digital premium environments. You, you can call it news platforms, lifestyle platforms, what have you. Um, the scrolling speed is much slower. So audiences tend to engage more. They tend to view the ad for a longer time. 
as well as then they will uh, they will uh, they will then engage with the ad as well as the brand. And the last one is one of my personal favorites. Uh, this is again an example by Suntori, but here it's a little more Zen, a little bit more Japanese, like what the brand stands for. Uh, on the left, they talk about just the different whiskeys and the different tasting notes in each of them. So it helps um, a potential whiskey buyer discover which is the right which is the right bottle for him or her. On the right. It actually takes you through the history of Suntori as a brand. It, it takes you right, right to the uh, the early twentieth century, what the brand did during the time, to what it what it is doing now. It really gives you a, a full scale adaptation into uh, into the the story and the history of the brand, which which I personally love. Well, with all these ad formats, no wonder the ad recall factor is really so high. Now, but what about omni-channel marketing? Julius, do we have some insights regarding that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, there is, yeah. Uh, so rounding up this section, right, how consumers, how shoppers feel about omni-channel marketing, our study found that 61% of shoppers felt that omni-channel marketing is more effective in influencing their purchasing decision, more so than single-channel marketing. And interestingly, we also found that 62% of shoppers feel that TV ads do expose them to new products in the market, right? So these findings and what we share on other sites do reinforce the importance of omni-channel marketing, right? Not just only, you know, doing social or just doing, you know, radio or TV, but really a mix of it to allow advertisers to effectively reach out to the consumers to educate them about, you know, their products, the benefits of their products, you know, uh, things that, you know, a single channel can't do, you can do it across multiple channels. Yep. Actually, uh, we have come to the end of this section about some media insights and their ad recall, their ability to drive uh, action. Um, maybe we'd like to take some questions at this juncture. We have a question over here that asks us, for the social, it has the highest ad recall. Julius, are there is there any difference by demographics? Yeah, so uh, there are no significant difference in terms of gender, right? Uh, equally effective for age group, right? What we noticed was that social media was less effective, and and what I mean by here is that the uh, lesser recallability for the older uh, shoppers, the older fifty to sixty five years old online shoppers. Cool, and there's also another question that asks about. Does the data mention apply for both online and offline consumer purchases? Uh, yes, so uh, as I mentioned at the start, right? So these are online shoppers, but they must have an offline purchasing and browsing behavior. So this, what you see, the insights do apply to offline purchases as so. well. Wow, we, the questions are really blowing up. Um, maybe we can take one more question. Uh, any difference between male and females in terms of purchasing behaviors? Okay. Uh, well, if if I were to show you the the, the differences across the genders and and ages, right, it, it will take longer than this hour. Uh, but let me just give some flavor, right? Uh, in terms of differences between male and female for the motivations for impulse buying and whether or not they look forward to sales event, there's no differences. Male and females, they all look forward. There's an impulse because again, we are creatures of, you know, uh, emotional creatures, right? We just buy an impulse when we see things that the shiny and it's shouting at us. Uh, but in terms of categories of products, yes, there's slight differences. Yeah, but I'm, 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 I would like to apologize. I'm not able to share the few differences between the male and female in terms of purchasing categories. But motivations wise, there is no differences. Yep. And actually, there's one more question that leads us perfectly into the next section. With such short attention span, could you share some attention grabbing strategies or examples that sticks in your mind? Um, so this is where I'll enter the next section where, um, where we talk about preference for different types of ads. And Julius would like to first take all of you down a trip down memory lane along with Raj. Yeah, so do enjoy these two ads. Here we go. (laughs) 
东西在哪里？拿出来！我不知道。哈哈哈哈废话少说，快拿出来！我真的不知道。All right, and we have one more, right? Here we go for the second ad. Hello, Mr. India Curry House. Yes, we have chicken kebab, but okay, one butter chicken. Yes, sir. We deliver everywhere. I repeat your order. One butter chicken, one spicy biryani. Your address, please. Singapore. Is it a suburb? Another country? Hey, Mumbai, da? India. With M1 free IDD calls to India and more, it's easy to get carried away. Now, we all know that these are fairly old examples, but we just wanted to tickle the nostalgia bone in each one of you. <laughs> um, so yes, so which, which one of you actually remembers these iconic ads? Um, I think what we're trying to say here is really that great creatives invoke an emotion in you, which is the audience. So even after all these years, some of you may remember this great IKEA ad, you know, um, and you may also remember this iconic M1 ad. It leaves you with a happy feeling, <clears throat> maybe even a chuckle, maybe even a, a just just a, a, a small laughter. And there's still a place for such ads that help build brand love and preferences among all others in the category. They communicate the brand's features, key benefits, and paint a really meaningful picture of the story. That's the narrative. Back to you, Jenna. Yeah, so the Raj really hit home with the, the point that he made, right? Uh, these two ads never fail to give me a slight uh, tickle in my funny bones. Right. And they are greatly into this last part of our webinar. And, you know, if you remember seeing those ads, you and I are of similar vintage, right? So in our study, we tested liking and preference for two types of ads, right? So they are mainly tactical ads and storytelling ads. The tactical ad that we tested is an Amazon Black Friday ad, Black Friday sale ad. And it highlights the best deals you can get on Amazon during the, their Black Friday sale. And the storytelling ad is from Standard Chartered, and it tells a short story about how the bank has supported over 603,000 talented young people from low-income communities in the past three years. And this is to reinforce the bank's Here for Good slogan, right? Both ads are short ads, which with about 30 seconds runtime. We showed both ads to respondents and asked them if they like and if they prefer which type of ads. And the key point to make on this slide is that, right, you know, the preference for tactical and storytelling ads were largely similar. So both are equally uh, well-liked and preferred. But where, where the difference really comes out, right, is that when we examine further, we, we see that the difference for liking and preference appears across different shopper segments, right? So for storytelling ads, there is a stronger liking by shoppers with higher monthly household incomes. And there's a stronger preference for um, storytelling ad for older shoppers or so, right? So for, 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 for what does this mean, right? You know, you need to really know your target audience. You really know what type of ads they like and they prefer. And then you can push the right kind of, uh, right type of ads rather, right? To, to, to your audience. Uh, that said, right, regardless of whether you choose to run a tactical or storytelling ad, I think a key point I cannot uh, belabor, right, you know, I really want to belabor here is, right, that the key message of your advertisement must be clear and understandable, right? So our study found that shoppers who dislike any type of ads, right, stated that the ads were difficult to understand or confusing. So in order not to be disliked, you make sure, better make sure that your ad is clear and understandable. And related to this point, right, I'd like to share an aha moment that I had with one of my mentors. Um, so if you're not going, if you're going to invest significantly in a campaign, and that campaign investment can go up to six digit or more, it is not exorbitant at all to spend about five to ten percent of that six digit investment, right, to test your campaign messages, right. In fact, right, it is a necessary expenditure to ensure your campaign messages are clear and understandable. 
and it's really to increase the chances of success of your campaign, right? And you know, zooming back the conversation, right, from campaign to advertisements, our study also found that advertisements that capture audience attention feature some of these ingredients, right? Ingredients such as ads which feature discount and promotion sales, right? Ads that are short form, ads that have a meaningful story about a brand or product, and ads that also provide information, key benefit about the product. And the key takeaway is that, you know, these ingredients are not mutually exclusive. You shouldn't go for one or another, right? As with the earlier two example ads, right? IKEA and M1, you need to include a mix of these features, right? Short form, communicate a meaningful story or message about your product or your services to really help increase the chance of your ad capturing audience attachment, uh, 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 capturing audience att attention, right? That is, and if you sprinkle some humor into the mix, there could be a high chance of it going viral. Then Raj, now that we know all these um, key factors that capt capture shoppers' attention, would you have some examples that maybe you can show the audience? Absolutely. Back to my passionate storytelling <laughs> ingredient. Um, I do have, I have actually two recent examples. Um, so the first one is for Strepsils. Now, uh, you know, we all know that Strepsils is a very functional brand. It really talks about the functionality and the brand promise that it delivers uh, uh, to its consumers. Um, however, uh, this ad is very, very interesting. And there's an interesting story behind it. Strepsils engaged a content creator to create a social video, right? They could have chosen any content creator, a famous one, someone with a lot of followers, someone who reaches their demographics. However, they chose a content creator that is actually a, 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 a beatboxer. So everything he does, his entire trade, is, is using his voice. He uh, Every aspect of the video that I'm going to play is done by his voice and his voice alone. The background music, uh, the singing, uh, the rap, uh, even, even some of the musical instruments that you may hear is all done with his voice. There is no, there's, there's nothing external that's done it. Uh, so let's take a look at that video. Here we go. The weather has me ragging up Something ain't right I send it to the back And it's creeping down inside Why is my voice cracking? <clears throat> Must be the late night fry I don't know what I'm gonna do now I wish you could cascade from the sky Like lemon drops to wet or dry Put your love into my voice tonight You know how you make me feel Celebrate your voice, we all go Na 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 till tomorrow Let your voice flow and we follow Na 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 till Stay voice ready Celebrate your voice, we all go Na 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 till tomorrow Let your voice flow and we follow Na 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 Strap seals Oh, that was damn cool. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Ad. I found myself bobbing to the beat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite catchy. Um, talking about catchy beats, the second example is also a cool one with a very catchy beat. This time, it's a rap. It's a rap video that uh, uh, two of uh, uh, two of uh, 987's DJs have done. So everything from the lyrics uh, to the singing were done by the DJs. Uh, they've gone into Subway to film it and they've created a Subway rap. Now, this is very catchy and, you know, we know uh, a good rap always works wonders. Uh, we know a lot of brands do jingles. They, they, they have their specific voiceover talents or they have their taglines, but a rap is still not mainstream. So let's look at how Subway did it. Here we go. Hey, so what you wanna? I don't know. Start with the bread and you can't go wrong. Do you want a six inch or a foot long? What I heard is, there's a new sensation. Hit me up now cause it's Rendang Nation. Chicken with lots of spice or the beef sub that's all so nice. What a sweet treat. Yeah, we can have a looky. Hey Joe, look. There's a pandan cookie. The Rendang sub is available now at all Subway restaurants. Try it now.
quite catchy, yeah, Julius. <laughs> Uh, cool. So I think that's uh, that's the end of what we wanted to share today. Um, we'll just quickly go through a summary of uh, some of the top line highlights that we did share with you. Yep. Um, and I shall take everybody through the top five points that we really want you to take away. Okay. Firstly, offline retail is important either permanent or pop-up stores, these offline spaces are touch points to allow consumers to experience and learn more about your products. And they also serve as outdoor marketing for your brand. Secondly, impulse buying is still a thing, especially for individuals from higher household income. Opportunity for you to grow your sales by creating the occasions to drive impulse buying. And obviously, Omnichannel can help, which leads us to the next point, that Omnichannel Omnichannel is indeed impactful where 68% of shoppers can recall ads from at least three media platforms and your ad recallability actually jumps 38% when you advertise on three platforms versus two platforms. Next, ads must be clear and understandable. Invest time and resources to ensure your ad creatives and campaign messages are clear and understandable to increase chances of a successful campaign. Yes, so we have actually come to the end of our webinar today. We have about four more minutes and we'll like to take some questions. So let me just get into that really quickly. I think let's answer the first question. Uh, wait, it seems to have disappeared. We actually had a question earlier from Siddhartha and let me just bring that up. The question is, are marketers and media folks on the brand side willing to understand the nuances of comms and content when it comes to campaign performance? I just feel that there is too much focus on campaign optimization, targeting, et cetera, without really focusing on the strategy from a content and comms perspective. Now, uh, Raj, you speak to clients the most. Uh, what are they thinking there? I think it's a fabulous question, first off. Um, it is something that we face quite often with uh, most of the e-commerce clients out there. I wouldn't say that clients aren't privy to some of the data points, such as you know certain demographics work very well. Uh, they spend much more uh, and buy much more. We saw Julius share earlier about how impulse purchases are a thing, you know, and they play a very big role. Um, we also saw that the 18 to 34 demographic is the number one when it comes to making online purchases. And the third data point uh, that stands out is that um, uh, consumers with a higher monthly household income of 20,000 and above uh, are the number one shoppers online, right? What this tells us is that certain creatives need to be catered towards these audiences. It, it could be one bus, one one set of segment that you build in, or it could be multiple segments. But um, just going back to you know a phrase that Julius used earlier, which I love, is it, it shouldn't be a race to the bottom. It shouldn't just be about promos, tactical offers, coupons, and the rest. So I think a, a large part here is to educate some of these um, uh, e-commerce brands on the trends that we see as a as a media platform and at the same time marry it with the trends that they see since they have a, a lot of data on their at their end as well and see how we can marry that and, and make something a little bit more meaningful rather than just focus on on price because again race to the bottom no one likes that yeah i'd like to offer a bit of a perspective here right so you know really look at the objective of your campaign i mean if you're i mean ultimately i know the objective of every campaign is drive sales right that's the end point ultimate end point but i need to look at some waypoints right you know um i think raj mentioned about brand love uh a lot of campaigns i think we're seeing nowadays very focused on very tactical you know uh selling promotion and sales that doesn't drive brand love at all right so i think fundamentally you need to think about uh this right what is the direction for your brand are we just going to constantly shouting out on sales promotion low 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 price right how about you know brand equity can can some campaigns be focusing on building brand love? I think that is a question that really um, most companies need to sit down and 
really decide what is that, you know, uh, strategic objective. Okay, maybe we can go on to another question uh, that is probably closer to my heart. The question is, is FTA TV still relevant when we are seeing drop in GRPs year on year? Now, uh, I must agree with you. Uh, GRPs are dropping and can be quite inconsistent uh, due to people going out more with having more options uh, on what they can do in their leisure and just between uh, media platforms. But what we can see over here on this slide is that 59% indeed still are able to recall ads from TV and 63% actually were, took action after that. So is it still relevant? Yes. I think the question should be, can we simply just go with TV as, as the only media platform in your campaign, which I think by now you, you would know that the answer is probably no. Um, our, our audiences, or rather Singaporeans are all over different media platforms. The only way to successfully help with the ad recallability through frequency is through ads that come in different contexts and at different timings and that drive the message home. So the message here is yes, FTA TV is still relevant. However, you would want to definitely consider an omni-channel uh, mix, which uh, includes three or more media platforms. Yes, do we have time for one more question? Is there a... Let's just take a last one. Is this, is that the radio one? Raj, which one would you like us to take? Um, I saw one recent one, which I thought was a good one, which is uh, noted that the ad recallability jumps 38% when you advertise on three versus two platforms. Is this finding based off all the MediaCorp campaigns? What's the denominator? Maybe we'll pass it back to Julius. This actually came as a result of the consumers replying to our survey. Yeah, it's a very short answer. It's, this is not based off uh, MediaCorp campaigns. This is based off that survey findings, right? We asked uh, respondents, do you recall seeing or hearing? Uh, the, the, any brand or retailer advertisement campaigns recently on each of these following platforms and then they select accordingly. And then, so this is what has been stated by the online shoppers from our study. Okay, I think um, we, I, we will take this last question and it's a perfect way to end off. We have a question over here that asks, uh, is this something that we'll be doing annually? Can we... Uh, can we update you along the way? So the answer is yes, we have plans to make this a regular survey. So you really should stay tuned and we will find uh, different opportunities to share the information with all of you, either uh, from MediaCorp perspective through our account servicing and also on our website. Uh, there are many questions that we are posted here. We are unable to un answer during this session. We will post the answers in the website. And if I'm not wrong through the EDMs that we'll send out to thank you for coming to this webinar. So on behalf of all the speakers and on behalf of MediaCorp, uh, thank you for attending Executive Insights by MediaCorp. We hope to see you next time and we hope that you were able to take away something useful for your business and work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Everyone.